um, when some happens on here. There's other people that will come in on the way, and I'm sure they're stuck in traffic, as I know several of you have been tonight. Um, on behalf of the Herb Kelleher Center and our Entrepreneurial Life uh, Series, my name is Laura Kilcrease, and I'm the Entrepreneur in Residence at the Macomb School. I'd like to um, introduce you to our guest of honor tonight and our speaker, Rob Neville. And let me tell you a little bit about Rob. Rob currently serves as CEO and president of Austin-based Savara Pharmaceuticals, which was founded by Rob in 2008. He currently sits on the board of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, uh, the Central Texas chapter, a nonprofit foundation focused on the treatment and cure of cystic fibrosis. Prior to Savara, Rob was founder and CEO of the of the Austin Technology Incubator-based Everty Inc., which was acquired by BMC in 2000 for $100 million. Based on his work at Everty, he was honored as a finalist for the Entrepreneur of, uh, Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. In addition to Everty, Rob has successfully founded and exited companies in a variety of, of industries. Mr. Neville holds a postgraduate engineering degree from the University of Natal in South Africa. Rob, welcome. Thank you, Laura. Tell us about your entrepreneurial journey. I know you have, you've been on this path for a, a long time in your career. So you're saying I'm old? No. <laughs> <laughs> if I was old as like you from these exits, I'd be happy. <laughs> sure. Um, so let me go back to where I was born. I was born in Durban, South Africa. Um, it's about a city twice the size of Austin, I think, maybe even three times the size of Austin. Um, it uh, is, uh, I, I was born in a, in, in a pretty poor neighborhood in, a, in an area that's probably equivalent to the Bronx of New York. Um, it was known as the Bluff. It would be rough and tough if you came from the Bluff. Um, my mom and dad were, um, neither of them had a, went beyond 10th grade. In fact, my dad, I don't believe, even went beyond 8th grade. We lived in a government housing area, so I had a lot as, as a young kid to overcome. Um, I, because of that, became very driven to succeed, and for a number of different reasons, I ended up being entrepreneurial. And uh, the few early uh, things that I did, the first one, I, uh, at the age of 15, the Rubik's Cube book came out, and I was intrigued with that. I spent a lot of time trying to solve it, and eventually did, and um, ended up writing a book on how to solve that. Um, at the same time, I was competing in all these competitions, and was very close to the world record, and. Um, but that book sold very well. It allowed me to buy my first transport and pay for my own university. Um, uh, I was the first in a, a, a big extended family of folks that actually went to university. Um, so studied uh, computer science um, in, and business in my undergrad and then, and then computer science in my postgrad. Um, so the next entrepreneurial thing happened. I actually went on faculty um, in the research department uh, in uh, the university during my postgrad. And while I was there, computers were just starting to become, you know, you know mainstream in, in industry. And folks were coming into the university saying, can we control this industrial equipment to cut these heating elements? And I was like, yeah, I think we can do that. Um, you know, after the Rubik's Cube book, I felt that I could do a whole lot. So, um, so and that required Fourier transforms real time. And so I hired some of the faculty members to be on a team, and we solved that problem. And all these problems kept coming, and I was solving them and hiring folks and we ended up getting a thriving consulting practice and so did very well with that. And then as a, as a South African um, uh, citizen, I had to then shut shop down and go to, um, to, the, uh, to military service for two years. It was mandatory. And so I literally had to end that very thriving business and go to the, to, to, um, uh, the actually went into the Air Force. Um, and fortunately, immediately after boot camp, I was called back to a company. It's kind of like a Raytheon that did um, you know, uh, development for the, the, the arms industry. And we were actually at war in Angola. So this wasn't just you know, going to military for the sake of training. We were at war in Angola. And um, I was asked to lead a program in the electronic warfare division. Um, based on the experiences that I'd had in the consulting, they, um, they put me in charge of this program to protect our aircrafts from uh, threats, so you know, uh, surface-to-air missiles and these things. So it was fun. Uh, we had actual, you know, jets coming in, and we could plug our computers into it and simulate all these battle scenarios. I was actually trained as a combat pilot as part of that. Um, the whole time I was doing that, and it ended up being about five years, I had the entrepreneurial bug again and wanted to do something. I then started on the side a company 
it was somewhat like a CompUSA, for those that remember that, that was around. It was both a retail uh, as well as a services company. And we sold computer systems and did installations into, into schools and um, hospitals and these types of things. So um, that actually went very well. We were uh, revenue generating almost immediately and profitable within about six months of starting. And so made a, a good revenue stream off of that. Eventually sold that. It wasn't a fantastic exit, but it was, it was an exit. Um, and uh, then that was when I was 29. And so 29, I got on a plane, came over here to the United States, um, now a small fish in a big pond um, versus where I'd come from. And uh, because of, uh, I had an H1B visa, I couldn't start my own thing, so I, I had to go back to the consulting and did a number of very fun projects. Um, for instance, I was asked to be chief architect of the Sivon pro project, which was a $2 billion installation of uh, surveillance for the Amazon jungle. And this was to protect it from illegal drug trafficking, mining, and uh, deforestation. So we had AWACS planes and satellites and all that protecting that. So I was chief architect of that for a while. Um, that, was, that was interesting. Um, I also did uh, uh, the first 3D CAT scan imaging system. Um, so that sort of was my first, I guess, uh, healthcare um, venture. Um, and the, but I still had this, I, I couldn't stand being in these big companies that had all this politics and red tape and you couldn't do things at the speed you needed to. Um, so as soon as I could, in fact, the day after my, uh, uh, my honeymoon came back, so now I was, I, I was now able to do my own thing. Literally the day after I got back, much to my then wife's dismay, started a company. And that was, <laughs> <laughs> and that was Evidy. And Evidy was in the system management space. So this was uh, in 1999 when websites were just starting to make money. We came up with this idea that you needed to monitor the websites from multiple locations and inform the companies. And, we landed some key clients like American Express, so we did very well, and we exited that um, in a very nice exit. Um, the, uh, I think our initial investors got 37x somewhere around there on their on their investment, and they were one year and one week or two weeks from, uh, you know, so just long-term cap gains for them versus short-term cap gains. So that was um, that was a good exit. I then sort of wandered the desert for a while, to be honest, trying to figure out what I needed to do with my life. I went to help start a, a nonprofit in East Austin for at-risk kids. I spent uh, four years at Dallas Seminary, did a, did a degree there, and uh, also volunteered in a whole bunch of things, always trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And eventually, sort of lightning struck, I was able to write a vision statement for me. We're so good as entrepreneurs at doing that for companies and for you know, de departments or, or, or products, but we're, we're very poor at figuring out what our vision statement needs to be for our own lives. So I finally figured that out and realized I was in the wrong industry, so I needed to switch over and uh, get into the life sciences. And my vision statement, I won't go into it, but it was related to TB and, you know, having come from Africa, I wanted to make a difference. And so this company, I was investing my own money in companies and as an angel investor, and this company came along that had a couple of guys, they were just starting out this company and really struggling. In fact, it was about to go out of business. And so I led the round uh, and uh, got um, some of the folks that had made money off of me in the past to inv invest in the company. And uh, we got going. And this was, an, uh, this was the company that I'm in now. Um, it's called Savara. And basically what we're doing is we're treating patients with cystic fibrosis. This is a genetic disease that causes, you know, these uh, the sticky mucus in their lungs. They get infections chronically. Um, and these chronic infections cause damage in their lungs and ultimately death. And um, they can't take enough antibiotics to kill the bug. And so what we've done is we've taken a known antibiotic, put it into a device, it's a known device, and, uh, and then they basically inhale it just like an asthma inhaler. And you get antibiotics in the lung. And so we're going through clinical trials and the company's doing, doing well. Um, in fact, we've raised 28 or 29 million. Matthew, I can't remember the amount. So we've raised a lot of money, in fact, from um, from uh, non-institutional investors, so a, a huge amount of money, and I'll talk more about that later, I'm sure. But I've got a few high-level lessons learned. If you want me to Please. go through that, okay. Um, okay, now I've got to really think about this. So as I, and this is actually the first time I've really sort of told my story chron chronologically, I think, and um, um, I think as, as, I, as I look at that, and I've, I've also now, and I love helping entrepreneurs that have an idea and they want to know how to finance it, and you know, you, so I'm, I'm available to anyone that, that wants that help. But as, I, as I've been uh, presenting now um, and seeing tons of companies, um, and seeing a lot of um, successes and failures, and even with my own experience, um, and I don't remember where I first heard this quote, but as entrepreneurs, especially in this instant gratification in, you know, society we live in, we, we want to uh, take the elevator to success. And, and real life in companies, you usually have to take the stairs. 
and, uh, and, and, and as I contrast even some of my prior exits, um, Everdy was in Elevator, right? That was, you know, about two years in total making, but a year really from when we took money to, to exit. That was an Elevator, but now Savara, um, I've been doing this now coming on seven years, and, um, you know, there's no, you know, the exit is not something that we, um, that we've really, you know, we've, we've, we've contemplated it, but, uh, you know, the prop, the prop, and, and so I think most of the time, you just got to grind it out and get the company going and, and bring it, you know, to profitability and, and the like. And, um, I, and I think it's hard because as entrepreneurs, as we're presenting at these different forums and trying to get money um, into the company, we're, we're told, uh, you know, you have to have an exit, you know, exit plan and you've got to have ROIs and you've got to have these comps for other companies. And, and so your thinking is always exit, exit, exit. And the problem is you don't control exit, you know, People buy you, you can't sell yourself, you can't put, you know, and, and you know, I've done sales processes and it usually doesn't work. You usually, companies will buy you when you're doing well. And, and, and so the, the one lesson or the one encouragement I give folks is to focus on building great companies and getting your, your company to profitability rather than trying to build the company so that someone will buy you. Um, otherwise that's frustrating because you just can't make them write, write the check. Does that make sense? That makes, makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm I've got, got a few more. Oh, you got it. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to stop you there okay. for a second and say, so how do you make it known that you're available for sale? Well, I think that's the problem. I don't think you should. You don't think you should? No. And we've run a sales process, and, and I think what you're basically doing is you're saying we're for sale, and, and I don't think that puts a lot of confidence in them that there's something there of value. If it was of value, then you would say, then I'm not for sale. I'm going all the way. And you're always willing to entertain those discussions. Right. If the economics are right, you'll do it. But I think the way you maximize the deal is if you continue to grow a company. So you just keep trucking along, keep growing it, and, and wait for the people to approach you. When they approach you, as has happened with Everty, and, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you've had other approaches in some of these other companies mm -hmm. over time, you know, how do you handle that as a CEO? So there's two approaches. The one, and, and we've, done, we've done this, um, where you hire a banker and you run a process. So, um, and you've got to be very careful when you do that because you basically now, what the banker does is he's got his commission centered and he's going to go out and he's going he's to go and ask all the other companies. There's, there's someone interested in buying this company. Do you want to play? And uh, you, know, you have to have your letter of intent in within 28 days, whatever it is. Um, You've got to be very careful because if that sales process falls through, you've basically said to the world that you're wanting to sell your company. Mm -hmm. And it becomes much harder later on if you want to sell the company to get these people interested. And so what I would suggest, in, rather than running a process, is, is if someone gives you an offer or, or, or verbally indicates interest, you say thank you and put that in writing. And if you put it in writing and it's interesting enough, if you're willing to actually accept their offer, only then do you run an investment banker M&A process. Interesting. Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel about the investment banking process? Is it something that's helpful? Is it something that just takes lots of time? I've heard very different views on, on that process in terms of how it's been for you. It always depends on who you get, right, and right. How, how good they are. The, 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 you know, I've met some really good bankers and some that, that just, you know, they're just sales guys. So it's, it's varied. But I, I, think, um, I think there's a place for them, for, for certainly. Um, and, uh, you know, they do take a big commission, which, which doesn't seem like a whole lot uh, of work that they have to do to, to you know, to, to pull it off. But um, th there's a lot of value in having an, a, a third party person, um, you know, uh, calling on these companies rather than yourself and then, and then negotiating the terms of the, of, of the exit. Um, or, you know, so I, I think there's, there's certainly value. You've got to just be very careful you don't pull the trigger prematurely on that okay. process. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. You had other lessons you wanted to share. Well, you? yeah. So I think, uh, and I could I could go on for a long time with these, but what I, I also figured out as as I was going over the you know the the chronology was, um, you know, it's, we we usually hear that um, that you learn a lot from your failures, and I, and I think you do, but I, I I would say that you learn a whole lot more from your successes, and um, in the case of uh, of even the Rubik's cube book, as you go as far back as that, that is as much as it was small. It gave me a lot of insight on how to actually take an idea and, and actually bring it to fruition, and then, um, and uh, you know, and, and then the confidence that I got from that 
gave me the confidence that when I was then in university and these, these problems came my way, I felt that I could solve anything. And then, and then doing that gave me the confidence to then take the next you know, challenge. And so um, as entrepreneurs, sometimes we try and get these billion dollar ideas that are you know, gonna save the world and I think eventually you can get there. But you know, I think starting out with something that's, that's manageable and you can get your arms around doesn't have to be a great success. I think that's a good place to start because um, I do think you learn a whole lot from what to do rather than what not to do. Make, right. Does that make sense? It does make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But for you, you've, had, you've participated in so many different industries. Mm -hmm. In those lessons of what to do, is there generally some principles that, that cross industries as opposed to are specific to an industry? I think sometimes, first of all, the disclaimer, I go into some of these things really not understanding all what's involved. Okay, so, so you know, for instance, it's in Savara, this, this is, um, you know, a whole lot more challenging than I probably, you know, was expecting, you know, with all the regulatory and the manufacturing and, you know, particle engineering of, you know, getting these aerosol particles to fly and the aerodynamics. And there's just so many aspects to, to that, you know. So I think sometimes it's, you know, you're, you just go into these things without... Um, without really understanding all the implications, and you figure it out along the way. Um, but uh, as far as, you know, I do think that there's common, um, you know, uh, components to being successful in a business. Um, for instance, uh, you know, knowing how to raise money, how to assemble a board, how to get the right team, and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, craft the vision and then iterate on that. Um, I think those are common across industries. Okay. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another lesson you said you wanted to share with oh. um, So have you all heard this quote from Zig Ziglar that um, um, your attitude, not your aptitude, determines your altitude? Have you all, have you all heard that? Um, and I, I agree with that. And, um, and so, for instance, you know, your attitude would be, you know, your passion and your integrity and, 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 your, and your, you know, your commitment and your loyalty to your shareholders and these things. And as I look at even Savara, um, or even back to the consulting business that I did when I was in college, I was hiring faculty. And these guys were clearly smarter than me and they had more experience and yet they were on my payroll. Um, and, and as I fast forward now to Savara, um, when I'm out, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not credible. And for many years I wasn't um, in being a CEO of a life science company. Most of these CEOs that I'm competing with as I'm presenting, they've got PhDs and, and MDs and, and, and often both, and, and here I am, you know, competing with them. They're, they're, their aptitude is clearly better than mine, and, you know, but, you know, the passion for what we're doing and, and, and uh, the commitment and these things. So I think, I think your attitude is, you know, the, the, the difference maker. Do you think because you actively moved from overseas, because you are foreign here originally, that attitude is different when you come from a different culture? So you want me to insult Americans? No, because <laughs> I'm also a foreigner. Okay. I have an observation. Perhaps I'll put this a different way. <laughs> at, at the uh, Austin Technology Incubator from its mm -hmm. inception 26 years ago, one of my observations has been that either first generation or, mm -hmm. or foreign founders of entrepreneurs, there's been a disproportionately large number of first generation uh, CEOs or founders mm -hmm. of companies and a disproportionate number of individuals who have chosen to emigrate here for mm -hmm. some reason. And it's always fascinated me yes. as to why that might be. I think, I mean, if you look at where I came from and where I grew up and, you know, uh, and I remember when I was like 22, someone said, do you have siblings? I thought, what, the, what does that word mean? And, you know, I just didn't have the education. And, but yet I had the drive to overcome my situation. So I, I think, you know, and, and things were just not handed to me. Uh, you know, I, I just didn't get a car when, you know, I had to buy my own transport and I had to pay for my own college. And I think when, you, when, you, when it doesn't come easy, I think you do have, a, 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 you know, a killer instinct. Yeah, I, you know. I, I, um, I, I tend to agree with you. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is when people move countries, um, they have to overcome barriers. Yes. I remember myself thinking, you're driving on the wrong side of the road, guys, uh -huh. aren't you? Um, and other barriers that you just have to overcome at a, a more mature stage in life. Yeah, and I, actually I remember coming to the United States at 29 and I was by myself and I only could bring $5,000 with me because of the restrictions through the apartheid era. So I, I didn't have a whole lot. 
um, I didn't have a job immediately, and I, it, there was, it, was, it was pretty daunting, you know, going into some of these big companies and, um, and you know, f first of all, how do you even get a social security number? How do you get a car? Well, you need credit history. And well, I didn't have a credit, how do you get credit history? Well, you have to buy things. Well, you know, you, you, it, it, the, whole, the whole process was pretty, was, was pretty tough. And then even in the business world, um, I think, you know, understanding the, the American culture and the American business world, I think there's a lot there that you have to learn. I, I yeah. absolutely, I ab absolutely agree with you. Let's go back to the funding a second on yeah. the company. Um, you funded Everty with Angels initially, right. and again, Savara. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a software company or a systems management company with angel funding is not so unusual, mm -hmm. right? But a pharmaceutical company with angel that's majoritively been funded by angels or totally been funded by angels? So, yeah, $29 million from about 300 different, different in, uh, investors. Tell us more about why you did that, how you did that, and how you managed 300 angels. Okay, so that's a different, that's a different question. <laughs> Remind me about that one. <laughs> um, so, you know, in the early days when, when, we, when I joined Savara, it was actually in, it, it had been formed, but it really wasn't a company. They needed money, and, um, and I personally wrote a check. And, and then some of the folks that I knew wrote checks. So the first round, um, it was a million dollars, um, it, it just made sense to, to, to be angel funded in that, in that regard. And, and I really believed in what we were doing. I mean, we were saving the lives of children. And I love that about, and I still love that about the, my, my, my current job. And so as we were um, doing the next round, the current investors wanted to do participate because we managed them well and we kept them informed. So they gave us some more money. And so we went out on the road and we presented to a few places and we got more. And then we just had success with that, and then the next round we had, you know, more success, and we just kept going. And this last round we just did, we did $10 million, and we did that in a very short order. Um, and, and it wasn't that we made a decision to be angel funded. We just figured out how to get angel money. And, uh, you know, institutional money will come, and hopefully soon. Um, but um, we just figured out that, you know, where are the rich people that write checks? Where do they sit in the world? And I've presented in Istanbul multiple times. I've presented in... Monaco, I presented in, in, in all sorts of places to get money. And I just, I just learned where they sit, and I learned how to tell a story that is compelling um, and uh, rises above the noise. And, and so that was re you know, really, I think, so the second question was how do we manage shareholders? Do you want, do you want to ask a no, no, no. question? So, okay. so tell us, but before you get to that, tell us a little bit about how you found where those people sit and who they are and, and was there a referral system between the angels to, re mm -hmm. to refer each other to you? Because I have talked to some of your angels and uh, you communicate with them exceedingly well. Thank so you. So for, quote, a guy who doesn't know his science, or at least in the life sciences, you would never think about it because the, the, they are very complimentary of the way you've communicated to them and how you approach them. Thank you. Well, don't forget that my scientists also review the material I write, so you know <laughs> it gets their their, their blessing. And, um, so it started out where we were just individually. I mean, if you're starting a company, you can't go to an angel. Well, you can, but usually you want to have an initial angel or two that are interested. And then, um, and so we did that, and we started meeting with. You know, I was having breakfast, lunch, and dinner with people that were willing to hear my story and telling my story and refining it and getting better and better and better. And, I'd like to tell you what constitutes a good story, if you have time. But um, I think that'll help um, entrepreneurs. But I, I, you know, over over six years of raising round after round, the story got better, and I figured out what resonated with angels. But after a while, I just couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't have that many lunches and 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 dinners. So just just you know, it's getting I was, my cal caloric intake was just going up through the roof. <laughs> um, and so what I what I uh, what I decided to do was to go was to, to go up a level and figure out where the angel groups meet and what's the process for those. And even that, after a while, and these angel groups, they meet everywhere, including here in Austin. C Tan is here, and N Tan is in, in Dallas. Um, uh, um, Han is uh, in Houston, and um, you know the Aggie Angel Network. And so I, I, I got a long list of all the angel groups eventually and said, I, I need to go to these angel groups. And even there, it was 40 to 60 people that write checks and. So I was presenting in front of these groups, and eventually I was like tired of flying around meeting all these individual groups. I wanted to go to groups of groups. Yeah. And so we went up the ladder and um, figured out where these networks of groups meet. And when you, because the, 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 the long pole and the tent in this process is the screening. You've got to go through a, a vetting process. And, and, and once you've done that, 
you then have to go through a diligence process. And so it's a long process. So if you can get that done in one angel group and then you automatically get the, the invitation to present to 30 others, that's the key. And so, so I, I basically found out where all these groups meet around the world. It didn't matter where they were ge geographically and sorted them and, 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 and slowly figured out which were the ones that didn't have geographic sensitivity so I could fly to Istanbul and have them invest here. They didn't care about that. Um, the ones that had, you know, uh, you know, that were interested in life sciences and specifically our area. So I prioritized them and I just began and I, I literally became a professional fundraiser and um, wow. figuring this out. So how much time of, of the last seven years do you think you've spent raising money? <sighs> Maybe 50% of my time. Wow. That's quite significant yeah. when you think about I'd have to go and look at my timesheets, but I'm, I'm sure it's, 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 a, it's a pretty big portion. Right. There. And, and the great thing with me is I have a team that is just fantastic. And they, they're from a technical standpoint, while I'm gone on the road, which, which for a while was a lot, um, they're able to you know, you know, carry the load technically. And you know, I still am involved in every decision. And, but you know, when you have a competent team, and I can specialize in keeping the company resource. And one of the big risks with companies, especially life science companies, is, is financing risk. You've got to keep the engine going. It takes a lot of money to get a product to market. I, I, ours will cost more than 100 million by the time we're done when it's, when it's market approved. So you now have the 300 angels. They've come mm -hmm. in at different stages of the financing chain. Uh -huh. How do you keep up with them? How do you keep communicating with them? How do you make sure 300 people aren't calling you every month to say, hey, Rob, what's going on this month? I, I do have quite a few calls, but um, <laughs> I think the, the answer is to, is to be proactive with communicating with them. In, in many ways, we try and run as a public company. So we have, we have investor you know, update calls quarterly. Um, we have investor briefs, so I'm, 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 I'm proactive, and there's a rhythm of, uh, of information that flows, and they're comfortable with that. They know that they can always call me, even though this friend, most of them don't, um, but every now and again, a few of them do, and I welcome that, because these are smart people. And um, one thing I want to talk about still is how do you tell a compelling story? And part of that is, is, um, is engaging these investors in the company and in, in, you know, in, your, in, your, in your thinking, and uh, I think that, um, I think that is something that's important to them. Yeah. Absolutely. So tell us more about how do you tell that compelling story? Oh, I'm glad you asked. That's Thank great. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so angels are different than, 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 than investors, and, you know, institutional investors, so professional investors. So when, when you're getting in front of angels, you've got to realize that they're looking for different things. And as I figured this out, and, and, and I'm stealing some of the, the you know, some, some material that I've also read on, on, um, on the three different hats that angels wear. And, and, and this, so this is sort of the first bullet on what it takes to tell a good story. Um, the first hat, they want to have a return. So they wear the economic hat. They want to know that they're going to get a return on their money, and just the same as institutions. But the, 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 the angels want to know that they're going to get a return earlier. And they don't have seven year or 10 year. The funds usually have a seven to 10 year life. Um, angels want to know that within two years, there's, it's feasible to get an exit. And remember what I said, you've got to build a company, okay, but you've still got to tell the story that there's an exit potential within two years um, or so, and that it's going to be between five and seven X. And if, if you're within those parameters, then I think that's going to, going to motivate them. But the second hat in, I, I, that they, they wear is a hedonistic hat, and this is that they want to be a part of something. They want you to acknowledge that they're smart, they've been successful, they're qualified investors, which means they've got a million or more uh, dollars. Um, so, and, and the way you do that is, and, and when, I'm, when I'm out there pitching the company, I, I, I truly believe that they can add value. And I'm, I'm wanting them to give me input. And, and when I'm first presenting it to them, I'm, I'm asking them for their feedback rather than their money. Um, and, 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 you know, and when they see that you, are, that, that you respect them in that way and that you respect the input, I think they, they get very motivated to, to be a part of the company. And then the third hat is an altruistic hat, and, and this is that they, they have lots of places they can put their money. They'll easily write a check to their church for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you want to appeal to that hat. You want, you want to tell a story that's going to motivate them emotionally, that you're doing something that's going to change the world. In, in the case of pharmaceuticals, it's usually pretty easy. Um, and uh, you know, you've got to bring them on an emotional journey as you're presenting to them about, here's a, here's a child who will die. And I think we can do something about it. With your help, I think we can make a difference in this child's life. And I think that's motivating to them. So that's the high-level bullet. There's many other things you've got to have. You know, you've got to have the market stuff. And you've got to have, you know, 
you've got to have all your work done and, uh, um, and these things are, are, are mostly the sort of conventional wisdom stuff. Um, I do have a paper that if you're thinking about crafting your story and telling a compelling story, um, uh, Steve Jobs was without question the, you know, the best ever um, speaker and there was a, a PowerPoint that was done, it's about 50 slides and I have that and it was why was he so effective? And, and uh, you know, if you feel free to email me or, or, or I can email, it's, it's, it's fantastic because it talks about some things like you never have bullets on a slide, you know, and especially when you get technical, you want to put bullets and data and, you know, and he basically put a computer in an envelope just to, you know, to, 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 to you know, and he could have had a whole PowerPoint on, on all these specifications and weights and all these things. He's put an envelope. Uh, you remember that? Yeah. Remember that? But, yeah, yeah. Um, and so there's some very uh, useful things in that. But at the end of the day, when you're pitching your idea, either to an individual angel investor or, a, uh, or an angel group or a group of groups, you're competing. There's a bunch of other entrepreneurs, usually five to ten. And I've, I've done this so many times. You've got ten guys there. They're smarter than you, most likely. In my case, most of them are, I mean, especially in this field. And they've probably got an idea as good, if not better, than your idea. The way you compete is by telling a more compelling story. You've got to figure out how to tell that story. And you know the number one thing, and this will fascinate you, how many hours do you think Steve Jobs practiced for every one of his presentations? Take a, take a wild guess. Uh, I'll bet it's quite a few hours. Give me a number. I'm going to put five, you on the spot. Five to ten hours. I would 80 say. hours. 80 hours. 80 hours per presentation. So he, he locked himself in a room, he came and he got his staff, and they gave him credit. And I hate doing this because I, I, I present in front of my team, and they're like, no, 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 using the wrong word. There. I'm like, you know, my, my ego doesn't handle that very well, but I'll get over it. Um, and they, they, they grill you over and over, and you, you've got to do it over and over and over until every word that you use has no ambiguity, that when you tell your story, it's crisp, there's no questions. And when I'm done with my presentation, if I get no questions, then it's a success because I've anticipated every question and integrated that into my presentation. That's fabulous. 80 hours is a lot of work, just in practice. Mm -hmm. How many CEOs do you, do you come across many CEOs that spend that much time? I was at uh, um, the BioCentury Future Leaders Conference last week, or was it the week after? Um, and um, so this is a big deal. These are, these are you know, analysts, public analysts and you know, bankers and all that. This is, you know, companies that are about to go public. And um, the one guy was literally, he had one of those yellow pads, or he was literally reading his presentation. Um, you know, and he had really good science. He was literally reading his presentation. So think about the public markets and how that's going to raise. It's not going to work. So I don't think that many CEOs do that. Some of them, it just comes naturally to. They don't need it. I know for me, like the, the, about four weeks ago, I was presenting at the Roth um, conference at, um, in, in uh, uh, Los Angeles. And I hadn't presented for a while. And I'm also now presenting the data for our clinical trial. And it's technical, and I and I and uh, so I spent. I went in a day early. I went on Sunday. I only had to present on Tuesday, and the whole of Monday, other than a run on the beach, um, but for the whole of Monday, I sat in my room in front of the mirror, going over and over and over, trying to get that the present, timing myself because you only get 15, 20 minutes at these present time getting it so that right as the clock ends, I'm done with my presentation, and I think that that um, you know instills a lot of confidence in and you as a CEO. Other than you get no questions when you're, pres when you're practicing with your staff, do you get to the point that you have a feeling that you know you're ready, you're as ready as you're going to be? No. no. Even today I was nervous coming here. No, you never feel that you're, that you're ready. And in fact, I remember in the early days, and w w probably one of the most humbling moments in my career, when I was first CEO of Savara, there was a life science conference in, in, in Houston. And so these are all my peers, and the room's full, and there's, you know, 50 to 100 people, I don't remember. And I'm presenting the stuff, and I didn't understand the science. And I presented a bit, of, I had basically memorized it, and if you get off track when you memorize it, then things just don't go well. You really have to understand it. And I remember a guy putting his hand up and saying, tell me about the, how did, he, how did the question go? Tell, tell me about the mechanism of action and the minimum inhibitory concentrations required for vancomycin to kill. And I'm like, I don't even understand any words. And you say, what planet are you from? I don't understand what you, and so I'm standing there like umming and ahhing and you know, and so it was very humbling in the early days. But I think as you, you know, as you just get, you know, expose yourself to this, I can answer pretty much any question now in this, you know, in this very narrow field. You go outside of that, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna get back to you on that one. But, yeah. but Rob, it sounds like you never give up. 
you just, you're persistent, you keep going, you learn more, you bring more information to the table. I mean, many people would say, oh my God, I embarrassed myself and should I keep going because I didn't know all the answers. But you, you were persistent. Do you think persistence is a, a key trait to someone who's, who's an entrepreneur? I guess, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. You just yeah. keep going. <laughs> just keep You know, I, I, that won't, I mean, there's been many times, like straight off of that presentation where I, I just wanted to go and hide in a hole somewhere. But, well. you know, I think that's, that's what entrepreneurs do is it's not easy. Like I said, it's not an elevator. It's a stairway to success. And there's lots of, you know, things that have come at you. And, and you have to figure out a way to solve them. In fact, that's another lesson learned, I guess, is, you know, success isn't, just a great idea and an exit success is hundreds of decisions every week and you know they all pile up on top of each other and and you you, you know there's, there's you, you have to be decisive and you have to make a lot of decisions and you have to you know navigate your way around bunches of problems um, for instance I had a few board members that weren't correct they were disruptive on the board and we had to get rid of them those are tough things you've got to do but you've got to do them decisively and um, the same with certain employees the founders that started this company no longer with the company it was very hard to do to transition founders who who started it um, so yeah you got to you got to make those decisions i'm going to ask you a question about team but for those of you who have questions if you would go to the mic so that we know you have a question that uh, you'd like to ask mm. Rob. in the meantime Tell me about team, people. You, you, um, how did you build that first team beyond the, the original founders? So we, the initial company was founded on a technology that turned out to be um, less than what we expected. So we pivoted it away. And, and the original team and the founders that started the company, you know, uh, it, it just wasn't working. It basically was a technology that we were hoping to license to other people in very much the same way as you want to sell your company, but if nobody comes, what do you do? If you've got a technology you're hoping other people will use, that's a horrible business model in my opinion because you're sitting waiting for people to use it and uh, you, know, you're not, you, know, you don't have matters in your own hands. And so we pivoted away and we started building therapeutics, actual products, and we have complete control of our own destiny now. Um, so the original team, and, and, and actually partially as a CEO of a company that I really didn't understand, this was my you know, my training. I didn't take a salary. I didn't feel that it was appropriate until such time as I, I was able to, you know, appropriately contribute. I took no salary for the first few years. And, um, and then we pivoted away. And, and so I had to just change the team. And I had to change a team that was more appropriate for the therapeutic versus the, the platform that we were doing. And um, how do you find the right guys? I think a lot of it is, you know, you can come up with great um, you know, hiring practices. I have my own philosophies on what you do. I never ask them about what their experience is and all these things because people can tell good stories. I actually bring them in and make them do work and make them do, uh, you know, problems. He has, he has a problem we have. Solve it. And you, and you craft these problems and you have, you know, so I, ha I have my, but even that, it fails. And then you have, um, I've hired some folks in key positions that within, within six weeks, you know, this guy's is not gonna be able to operate at the level we need him to operate at. And you just be decisive and, 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 and transition him as soon as you can. Otherwise, it's gonna be just more painful later. Good to know. So, we have a question. Uh, yeah. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the years in the desert. We get a lot of people in here that are awesome, successful entrepreneurs who had a period where they were wandering. Uh -huh. And they don't talk much about that, right? They yeah. talk about, I exit and I was yeah. so successful. And, sounded like you wandered for a little bit. Can you tell us how you figured out what your vision was, how you came out of the desert? Phew. Okay, it was actually, the, for the first time in my life, I was miserable. And, and it's, it's interesting, because I'd had success and I didn't have to work anymore, and yet I was miserable. So, you know, that, so that was part of, well, what's success then? It's obviously not financial success. It must be something more than that. Um, and, you know, and, then I, and that was why I went to Dallas Seminary, is to, you know, figure out, you know, what does, you know, how does that inspire me and what, you know, what religions and, and how, how does, you know, you know, what can, can that give me a path forward? And um, I, I um, helped at, a, at my local church and volunteered there and um, all that was sort of parts of the puzzle and, and shaping me into what I really needed to be doing and trying to figure out, you, you know, my passions. And actually I went through, a, uh, I read all the books and um, there was one that was really good, and, and I'm probably not going to remember the, the name of the book or the author, but it basically did this. It asked me to put down my passions, bullet them, and 
experiences. And then your Myers-Briggs personality profile. You put all these on a page, and then you, you, know, you try and triangulate those and come up with what are you uniquely gifted in and, and passionate about. And, um, and, and so all that happened. Then I also had some health issues at the time um, where I, I ended up having, uh, you know, I, was, I, was, I had partial uh, paralysis. I was, I was paralyzed for, um, for, for nearly a year. And that, uh, you know, in that process, I, I started figuring out um, the vision statement, like what would really motivate me? What's that big goal? And I think they call it the big, hairy, audacious yes. something goal. What's that big thing? And, and, and I, I, I spent a lot of time actually thinking about that and walking up and down the beach thinking about what's that big thing that I could, I could totally commit my life to and probably never even get there. But if at least I can begin heading in that direction, that's really what shifted me away from, from the technology world into the life science world. So I, does that, yeah. okay, I can talk to you more afterwards, um, yeah. you know, in a, okay, sure. So success, and we all think that once you've had success, you've sold a company for $100 million, you go on right on to the sunset, but for you, it didn't give you purpose after you'd had that mm -hmm. success. You had to relearn or recreate or come up with your vision for your purpose. Mm -hmm. Did you know it was going to be something within uh, as profound as healthcare or pharmaceutical? It had to be so big a goal, do you think? Well, the goal is bigger than the current, current company. This is a stepping stone towards something that, that is beyond this. But um, once the light bulb went off, and, and I'll tell you when it happened, I was actually walking on the beach in Galveston. I had a beach house um, there, and I was listening to this, this Africa, uh, having come from South Africa, I, I like to hear the news, and it's just so heartbreaking when you hear about it all these things going on in Africa. I mean, we have such a sheltered life here. I mean, it's just genocide going on at the time in Rwanda. And this mom was saying how um, of her three children, the, the one child would, would be dead by the end of the week from, you know, starvation. And I'm thinking, it's just ridiculous. And, you know, so I was moved. Yeah. And, um, and so I started thinking that I need to do something that I can't, you know, and I'm in a very privileged position here in the United States. Um, I've had success. I can apply that to something, and so, so that that was really the, the 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 genesis of the idea. And you know, whether I actually eventually get to making a difference in Africa, um, time will tell. But I'm he I'm definitely heading in the right direction. But I, I'd also like to su suggest to you, and I'm I'm just privileged to have this knowledge, uh, Rob, that even before that point, when mm. you were coming to sell Everty, mm -hmm. you were generous enough to give options to ATI for student programs so that by the time you sold the company, those options were worth several hundred thousand dollars mm -hmm. that could be applied to student programs. Actually, we gave that after the exit. After the exit. So we didn't have to give it, but it was yeah. part of me acknowledging. So the ATI, for the all that don't know, it's an incubator here in town, and two of my companies have now gone through ATI, and um, they, they, they bring a lot to bear. And, they, and so at the time when we came in, they weren't asking for equity. In fact, I don't even know if I would have given it because I didn't know to what extent they would actually add value. Mm -hmm. um, but once we were there and we had the success, we then gave, and that came out of our own pockets. We actually ended up giving the money to the ATI. But you did it out of the generosity. You mm -hmm. seem that there's a part of you and what you do that's very important to give back. There's a social conscience there. Do you think about this um, in your everyday life? Is it something you purposefully do? Tom Shoes is a company that That's right. has a social conflict. That's right. It's so very obvious mm -hmm. in what they do. But it's not always so obvious in, in other companies and other individuals. Do you, do, do you actually think about the social I do. that you're doing? I, I do. You know, it's easy when you're developing products for, for children and you're going you're to make a difference. And, I, and, and one of the parts of my job that I love is I interact with these families and these children and their lives are devastated with this disease, and to be able to make a difference in their lives is fantastic. But then, even outside of just the industry we were in, I love helping entrepreneurs, and I have um, business plans in my inbox on a constant basis. Um, I'm mentoring companies all the time that are trying to raise money and helping actually get their story right, you know, getting that yeah. pitch right and sitting in the room and helping them craft it. So I, I enjoy that part. Yeah. Do you have time to sleep? 
You're running a company. <laughs> you're doing these good things. I don't you're sleep helping very entrepreneurs. Well. <laughs> I, don't, I don't sleep very well. But no, I, I, I have time. I make time for that. You make time. Yeah. It's important to mm -hmm. you. So you have your own version of giving back too and helping, not just in terms of money, but in terms of time and expertise. Mm. Um, Actually, I'm helping a company now that's uh, a fantastic idea. They're doing adult diapers. Okay, so they're, you know, if it turns out that, um, you know, with the, with the aging population, in fact, in Japan, there's more adult diapers sold than you, and this is for incontinence, and um, it doesn't sound sexy, but they're already selling $50,000 of adult diapers, and they were growing like this, and so I'm helping them present um, in front of these angel groups, and I introduce them into the angel groups. If I feel that they're ready, that I'm willing to put my name, uh, uh, you know, on that company, then I introduce them into the network, and they're now out there pitching, in fact, as we're as we're speaking now. That's fantastic. And you know whose company that is? Clay is involved in that. Oh. Yeah, okay. you know Clay. Yeah, Clay yeah. Davis. Yeah, yeah one of the co-founder of Ebony. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's fabulous. So you've kept up with your past team members or co-founders yes. like Clay. Yes. Even though he's doing something, again, completely different. In fact, he's an investor in Savara. Right. And I'm going to be investing in this round. In fact, I'm leading the round in, in his company. That's great. Yeah. That's fabulous. So you keep up with people over a longitudinal period of time, yes? I think that's you get what close. all... close? Is that part of... Some people, it's part of their network. Is it more than a network to you? I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, there's certain people that I'm very close to that I re highly respect, like Clay. Yep. Um, is he going to hear this? Okay, um, I'll get some good cre credit out of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He but, probably um, will hear this. You know, they're, they're, you know, I think a lot of, about even raising money when you've got 300 shareholders, a lot of that came from just getting to know people yeah. and, and not just seeing them as a check, but seeing them as, as, as people that can really add value and networking through that. So it, it really is, I mean, it doesn't matter what company you're doing, it's a relationship business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your, your, your team and, and all the folks that come around that, your, you know, it, it's, it's a relationship business. Um, so you mentioned you brought in uh, about 300 angels or so. Yes. How did you manage uh, dilution? What was your strategy? Um, and also mm -hmm. just to follow up. Um, gosh, I just forgot. Let okay, me well, let, me, let me answer the first yeah. one, then you can think about the yeah. second one. You know, uh, I used to be really worried about dilution. Um, and, you know, we've raised now $29 million. I would rather dilute than run out of money and end up with zero. Right, so you want to be well resourced. In fact, the best time to raise money is when you don't need it. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, dilution is a concern, but I would rather have ample money in the bank um, to be able to withstand all sorts of you know, events that are, un you know, unexpected. Does that make sense? So I, I'm, I'm not as worried about dilution, especially the team gets re-upped. So if the board is doing their job, the team is getting refreshed. As, as time goes on, as you, as you raise money. But still, I'm still sensitive because my loyalty is to my shareholders. And these, are, you know, these shareholders deserve a decent return for their investment, especially um, the early guys that took a big chance on me in, in, in new and life sciences. So, um, so how do you manage it? I think you start out with having very realistic um, valuations. If you start out thinking my idea is worth $5 million, and you raise money if you're able to, guess what? It's going to get really hard in the next round and the next round to maintain an upward valuation of the company. And so you need to start out low and you raise around. So let's say your, your initial pre-money is two million and you raise a million, your post-money is then three million. You want to make sure your next round is, a, is, a, is an incremental increase but not crazy because if it's crazy, again, it's going to be really hard to raise the next round. So you've got to be thinking long term. But, um, you, know, if, is, is, you know, there will be dilution along the way, but, I, you know, I think you need to be resourced. So does, does that answer your question? What was your second question? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that most of your, uh, of your team, you think that they're smarter than you, well, they're prepared so much. What's the, the, the dynamic, the culture there? How, how do you feel about that? How do you deal with that? Maybe it's linked because you're the CEO. Uh -huh. How do you feel about that? And how does your staff, how does that work? Well, well, that's, that's a really good question. And um, you know, the way that I, I manage my team is not in any way making decisions. And uh, it's a collaborative environment. Um, and, you know, I, I, I value each of their input on every decision. And, and obviously you need to have, you can't all be involved in all decisions. 
but we, um, we, don't, we don't have a meeting culture, but we're often talking, there's just a few of us, we're not a big company, we do al almost everything virtually, we've got manufacturing facilities in France and Portugal, and we do a lot of our stuff virtually, um, but we're just a small team that manages all that, but it's, it's a very collaborative environment, and you know, we pretty much come to consensus, and then the same on the board, I, I, I respect their inputs, and we try and collaborate and come to the, you know, the, the consensus view on, on where we're going, but, you know, if, if I came in and said, this is what we're going to do technically, then I just don't have the credibility to do that. I just can't do that. And um, I, uh, in, in certain areas, I will have more of an opinion. Um, so, for instance, we're hiring a new head of clinical operations right now. And um, he wanted to commute. I wanted him to be here. And the team felt that he was such a good guy that he should, we should allow him to commute. And I felt, no, I think we need to have that, you know, the, the team needs to, especially these team members, we need to get him here. And so we changed the offer letter. And so there are some things that I feel strongly about, but usually I don't. Usually I, I, I go with, you know, the consensus. Grace. Yes, I was interested in hearing more about the big pivot. You mentioned starting mm -hmm. out um, with Savra with a licensing kind of model right. and deciding you want to take your destiny. How did you go about doing that? Or where, where how did you to make that happen? Um, it was a hard pivot because when you take money from shareholders um, with a particular vision and then you and then you need to get them to understand because you can't do these big decisions the the way companies are structured at least C corps is you know with these protective provisions the the shareholders ultimately um, on the big decisions raising money and taking on debt and and these things they get to vote you know the the, the, the team presents to the board the board then says, yes, this is something that I think we can take to the shareholders, and the shareholders ultimately vote. So you've got to have your shareholders board in. And uh, with, with these big decisions like a pivot, you have to, first of all, get your board on, uh, on board. And that actually, in this particular case, there were at least one, if not two members, board members that were not um, comfortable with the pivot. And so we had to change the board um, and get the board online with the new vision. And then we had to go out to the shareholders, and we had to convince them that this was I'm in the best interest of the co company, and, and, and thank goodness we did, because if we had carried on in that business model, we would have been out of business, and now we, we have a real potential of having a return for our shareholders. So um, it's, it's a lot of communicating. It's a, spending a lot of time, even, with even if you've got to make 30, 40 phone calls to your shareholders, explain to them the rationale behind, uh, behind the, the, the change. But I, I, I would suggest if you, first of all, I, you know, heading out the door you don't always know what kind of reception you can have for your product or your idea. And I think it's so much better to head out in a direction and learn on the job and, 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 and see whether there's market, you know, uh, you know, get the market feedback and these things. I, I think that's so much better than sitting in analysis paralysis, never going out with your idea. And so pivoting is a great way basically to say, whoops, you know, we thought we had it set but we've learned a whole lot now, and I think we can do it, um, and uh, we can do it better now, and, and you pivot away from that. Sir, the last question for the evening. Okay, uh, you brought up the issue of credibility before, and often when, when investors are investing, they're investing in you as much mm -hmm. as the idea. Right. And so you successfully transitioned from a computer science background and a life sciences, followed your passion. But can you talk more about how you got beyond your, your bio when, when investors and people that are coming on board your team that you have to lead or looking at that bio, how did, how did you get past that, that aspect of it? Whew. I mean, you might have to speak to some of my shareholders. Um, I, don't know, I don't know the answer to that. I think, I think they trusted me. What do we think about it? I think they trusted, I mean, I and, and, and do um, believe that this company is their company. And, um, you know, and so how did they, I, I spent a lot of time with them and, you know, I think, I, I think part of it was the story, like I said, part of it was, 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 um, was the fact that I'd had some success in the past and so I could roll that forward and say, you know, it's not about, um, it's not about necessarily having the technical experience, I've got people for that, but I think you need to know how to run a company and how to raise money and these things, so. I think it's a lot of different factors that, that contribute to that. Um, let me think about that and talk to you later, okay? Well, um, you have accomplished an awful lot, Rob, and I know we're only a little way along your, your journey and your end, large, audacious goal. <laughs> 
Uh, we very much want to keep, keep up with you on that audacious go goal. But we're really honored that you'll join us tonight and share your story because it gives us all lots of lessons that we individually and collectively can learn from. So please join me in thanking Rob Neville. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.